Good morning, all. So, how are we all feeling this morning? We'll not talk about VAR, but uh, <laughs> what I am going to ask you a little bit is um, how you're sort of thinking through today. We're into October now. Um, and if you're a teacher, you're probably so glad that you've actually reached October because to me, September is the longest month ever. Um, and I'm going to take you back a couple of weeks to something Paul was doing. Paul was doing a little quiz. So I'm going to ask you a couple of little questions and see if you can get the answers. So how many legs does an octopus have? Eight. Eight. Yep. For the musicians in us, how many notes would there be in an octave? Brilliant. And for the mathematicians, how many sides does an octave have? Eight. Now, what month of the year is October? Why is that? Surely it's got to be the eighth month. Brilliant. Okay. What actually happened? A bit complicated. The Romans... The Romans were smart in that they realized that the calendar that was being used wasn't correct. They had to add in a couple of months, and then it still wasn't right. So what they ended up doing was March was the first month. So they moved it to the January to be the first month, which knocked all the months of the year out of sync. So October was originally the eighth month, but then it changed to become the tenth one. Okay, so one little change and had a big effect for all of us. And to some extent, that might happen this morning in church. As you come into church this morning, Adrian's going to bring Isaiah to us again, and you never know what changes might prompt into you and what effect that might have. So, sounds a bit scary, sounds a bit frightening, but don't worry, because our first hymn is really going to encourage us that, because it's going to remind us that because he lives, we can face tomorrow.
Okay, if you have a little seat. We'll join together in our confession this morning. Almighty and most merciful Father, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And the words that our Father taught us. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now if we all stand together, we'll join in the song of Isaiah. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion. For great is your midst, is the Holy One of Israel. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. <coughs> See, I am doing a new thing, now it springs up. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people my chosen. The people I form for myself that they may proclaim my praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen.
Please be seated. I think when we gather together um, for church like this, it's a wee bit like all of us, um, all of us heading off uh, on, on a day trip together. Now, the, the image falls down in all sorts of ways, because obviously if you all get into your own cars, you're separate from each other. But anyway, we're all traveling uh, along the same route together. Uh, and the, the liturgy, the songs, the Bible readings, the prayers are the route. They're the big motorway, or the, well, not a motorway, a great big road that we're all journeying along. But as we're all journeying along, each of us is looking out to the side, uh, seeing things in the fields. Uh, and the wonderful thing about this journey that we're on is not everybody's seeing the same things. So even in this group this morning, gathered here in the Church of the Transfiguration, uh, I hope you're already seeing different things. So when um, Eric mentioned to us there about the Romans changing the calendar, the thing that jumped into my mind was what the Romans ever do for us. You remember that? Was that Life of Brian or something? Wherever that came from. They mucked up the calendar for us. Well, they did lots of other things, of course. Uh, but I don't expect other people thought the same thought because it's not a necessarily a good thought. But anyway, what I'm really saying is that, as Eric was hinting at this morning, that as we travel on this journey, during these songs and these prayers and these Bible readings, um, we should be expecting that the Holy Spirit is going to light something up for each of us, that something will suddenly be highlighted. And the wonderful thing about this journey we're on together as a church service is that you can pull into a lay-by where there's a sign up that says beauty spot and you can stop and pause there and think on that thing and then when you think you've got it or absorbed it or worked out what maybe God was saying through that or trying to point out to you you pull back onto the road and you discover you're still in the day out with the rest of us so we example of this last Sunday night when we were here worshiping uh, as we quite often do, uh, we encourage people to just think about our week and our day and what life going on around us, and in the worship, bring it to God. And I was sitting over there, and uh, we were singing a song, and I have no idea what song we were singing because I had sunk deep into uh, a situation in our wider family that has been going on for a long time, and uh, it's really difficult and I'm not seeing anything resolving or getting better. And it's hurting us all. And I, I was praying into that, saying, I'm actually starting to get irritated with God a little bit, and got to the point where I had my fists clenched and said, God, what are you doing about this thing? It's hurting us. And then I said, sorry, I shouldn't be getting angry with you. <laughs> Uh, and I stopped to re-engage with the song, and Ruth and Sandy were singing the words, even when you don't see it, I'm working. Even when you don't feel it, I'm working. And suddenly my, the spiritual side of my life, suddenly, like a pilot light, just burst into, yeah, okay, Lord. So it's not the timing that I would like but it was kind of like, uh, and I don't know if anybody else in the room was experiencing anything at all, but that was my wee detour off the main road to just pause for a moment and argue with God and him reach out and put an arm around my shoulders and say, you know what, Adrian, I do hear you. I am listening to what's going on. I know all about it. Oh, sorry, could I switch on to my screen, please? So I'm inviting you to have the freedom when we gather for worship, not just this week, but at any point, that if you feel there's something suddenly highlighted in one of the songs or something that's going on, feel free to pull over and pause there 
Don't just feel because somebody has said sit down or stand up or that you, well obviously sit down or stand up or you'll be standing on your own somewhere, uh, which would look a bit isolated. But feel free to just engage with what you think God's saying. So here we are on Isaiah said and here am I. And for a few weeks now we've been trying to think of why settle for less. So let me take you back. Oh, it's jumped on already. Let me take you to this wee photograph. That's me in the middle. Yeah. Ah, uh, oh, thank you, Helen. <laughs> Although it did sound a bit sad, that. Oh. <laughs> right. And to my right, looking at me with his shifty eyes is William Davis, uh, who's thinking, who is that? Uh, to me. I was completely insignificant at school, as you can see by the picture. I was smaller than everybody else. My mommy made me wear shorts right into second form. It was so humiliating. I was the only one. Uh, my dad cut my hair, so you can see the scissor cuts uh, just above my ear there. Everything about it was uh, humbling, shall we say, <laughs> verging on humiliating at times. Anyway, Michael Boyd to my right on this side, the tall one, was my best friend, and he went on to become the, uh, the um, oh, John, Johnny Sexton of BRA Rugby, really. He was, uh, everything seemed to work for him. Uh, and the one behind me, smiling over my shoulder, is the cleverest person I've ever met. Uh, but I was completely insignificant, right? Very, and I, went, I progressed from this moment into an incredible amount of averageness. Uh, for the rest of my school career. But you know what? I had a great time. I enjoyed it. But this was part of it because we were just opening the Bruce building, uh, which was the Science and Maths, a new block while I was there. I think I was in second form there. And Lord Grey of Naunton, who was the governor of Northern Ireland, apparently the closest thing to monarchy in Northern Ireland back, this is 1968, 69, something like that. Um, walking down the corridors, we were all lined up, uh, and uh, he was walking past everybody, stopping to talk to people here, there, and everywhere. Uh, but he stopped to talk to me. And he isn't just grabbing me by the lapel there. <laughs> He's looking at my badge. Because in the school I went to, the only badges you were allowed to wear on your blazer uh, had to be um, recognizably Christian or church-based. So Michael, to my this side, has a BB badge on, yeah? Uh, William on the other side, if you look at, if you could expand it, it's some sort of cross. It's like um, uh, oh, one of those sort of mission organizations, but that's what he had on. And I had on my Belfast Cathedral badge. So I was really quite, probably quite unique in the school at the time. Uh, and there was a connection between the cathedral and BRA. That was how I got in. I got a place as a chorister. There were places kept for choristers in the school. So my badge was really quite different from everybody else's. And he stopped to talk to me. And for a wee moment, I was the voice and face of BRA. Yeah, Just for a moment. Because not only was I one of the few people he talked to, but that was the photograph on the front of the Belfast Telegraph that night. And you see, for the next two days in school, everybody knew me. Teachers who had never remembered my name before uh, suddenly remembered McCartney 1Y uh, was my class. And I was there. Anyway, for a wee moment, I felt like somebody had noticed. Yeah? So I don't want to make you dead sad or anything. I got on fine in school. It wasn't a miserable experience, right? Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, but you know, I, didn't, I never stood out from the crowd. So let me show you this. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behaviour is now set for the rest of their lives. And, when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. Isn't that just stunning? 
that you could put a lid over their lives. And they jump up hitting their heads on it until they realize, oh, I'm going to keep hitting my head on that. So they jump up to not that height. And even when you remove the lid and they're still captured in a glass jar, they never jump out because they've been convinced somehow that's my lid. And sadly, they pass that on to their children. That's the lid. Wow. Why settle for less has been the question of September. Isaiah, he's had this huge moment of seeing God. And then he realizes it's not just a huge moment of seeing God, but it's a huge moment of being noticed by God. Um, and Isaiah's lid on the jar was that the religious life of his time, when he was a priest in the temple, uh, had gone very wrong. It was in a bad state of decay. The politics of his time, through the uh, sort of the good king going into kind of retirement and his son and grandson taking over, uh, had all gone badly wrong. The nation was in a bad state. And that was the lid. Is it just going to be like this? And God broke into Isaiah's life and said, there is no lid. You can jump out of the jar and be my voice, be a representative of me who sees something more. I saw the Lord was his words. I saw the Lord means the lid is gone. I don't have to be restricted by the lid. And you're probably already, if you're drifting off into thinking, what are the lids that have been put on your life? Can I encourage you to keep pursuing that and asking God even this morning, what lids have been put on me? Uh, and in the context of this sermon and this church service, I'm thinking about the lids that have been put on our faith life, uh, not just the lids on our sporting life or our whatever. Another person, someone called Saul, uh, who was a Pharisee, but he was very anti-Jesus, and he was filled with bitterness, filled with hatred and vengeance, and he was on his way in Acts 9 uh, to bring persecution and imprisonment to followers of the Messiah, uh, if he could find them in Damascus. And we're told that he was knocked off his horse by a great big blinding light, and a voice, what was the voice of Jesus, who said to him, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And we read straight after that, that for three days, Saul was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Saul's lid on noticing who the Messiah was and seeing the truth of Jesus was his bitterness, his hatred, or maybe even a wee bit of his sense of, um, I know better than all of them. I've got it right. And we do get wee bits of that in the religious life of our world, of people saying, I've got it right, everybody else is wrong. That was the lid in his life. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, this is someone came to see Saul while he was blind. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. God broke into his life and lifted the lid. Said, you don't have to live a life measured only by your bitterness and by your sense of you know what's right and everybody else is wrong. Wow. John 21, Peter. Peter's lid uh, on his life uh, was his failure. He tried. He tried hard at times. He tried walking on the water. He tried uh, catching fish. He tried following Jesus. He tried speaking up. He tried doing all sorts of things, and he failed and failed and failed, and could be forgiven for thinking uh, at this point because this happens after the death and resurrection of Jesus that he has failed beyond redemption by denying Jesus in the court of the Pharisees or of the high priest the night that Jesus was arrested and then executed the next day. Peter had failed repeatedly. But watch what Jesus does. Failure is not a lid on the future with Jesus. Think this story, John 21. Uh, 
Jesus is on a beach. Peter's fishing. When did Jesus first meet Peter? On a beach while Peter was fishing, right? This story is going to like be like a mirror image. Um, Peter, uh, a mirror image of a number of things. Peter comes ashore and Jesus is cooking on a coal fire. The night that Peter betrayed, denied Jesus, he was standing beside a coal fire. The aroma of the fire was there. His, you, know, you know those memories that are uh, come to life because of aroma, smell? Like, you know, the sun cream that reminds you of, oh, Spain, how much would I love to be there? So the smell the same, the fish the same, on the beach the same. Uh, he calls him Peter. He asks him if he loves him. And he asks him three times, do you love me? Three times the denial. And then in John's gospel, as different from all the other gospels, uh, the completion of this lifting of the lid of Peter's life was Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, if you go back to the early chapters of John's gospel, um, Peter followed Jesus because Andrew took him. But Jesus said to Andrew, follow me. In John's gospel, it's not recorded that Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Now, it is recorded in the other gospels, but not in John's gospel. So in a sense, this is the moment when Peter hears those words himself. Follow me. It's like the lid is lifted off, Peter. And, of course, you will go on failing, but no longer is it a limit. Failing God is not the limit anymore. And I've heard many times over my years of minister people saying, I'm not good enough, or I couldn't do it, or, uh, oh, I could never be like that for God, or um, there's a, a lid. We've allowed a lid to be put on that doesn't exist in the life of faith. The lid is off. Peter's lid was failure. Paul's lid was thinking he's right or filled with bitterness. Uh, Isaiah's lid was the society that he lived in, and it was really difficult. Uh, there's a fourth one, and this is also from John's Gospel. And this is a woman, Mary Magdalene. And early on the first day of the week is a clue as to when this happened. It was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Mary Magdalene had met Jesus a year or two before this. Mary Magdalene had been uh, healed, delivered of a kind of demonic thing that uh, was affecting her personality and her whole life. Uh, and Jesus set her free from that, and he invited her to be part of his traveling group. Uh, she was the one of the, the group of women, along with the, the disciples. And they traveled together and ministered together. Um, but Mary was still suffering under the lid of culture because she's a woman and therefore not allowed to have any kind of voice or allowed to speak or to lead or to be any of those things until this day when at this tomb she's the first one there. She's frightened. She's fearful. She's probably feeling a bit of that sense of being a woman and should I be here? There might be soldiers. There might be all sorts of threat to being here. And then she turns and sees this person that she thinks is the gardener with light shining around. And he says, Mary, the lid is lifted off and tossed into the bushes. And he says to Mary, go and tell them, them being the disciples. And an apostle is someone who carries the message of the resurrected Jesus. Without putting a capital A on Mary here, she is the first apostle. The cultural lid is thrown away. Mary Magdalene says, went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. She carried the message and it was the message of the resurrected Christ. We never hear many stories more about Mary, but we have to believe that she was the first of what would become a movement uh, that would 
will still go on dealing with that cultural thing that wants to be a lid on women. So whatever the lids are, you cannot let them be lifted off. Whatever it is that says to us, you can't or you won't, you're not good enough, you tried that before, it didn't work out, we have to have the courage to say, no, I must again meet with Jesus and let him lift the lid off whatever. Let me just conclude. Jesus needed a lid lifted off his own life as well. Luke chapter 2. When his parents saw him, that's, he's 12 years of age at this stage, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been actually searching for you. Now here's a lid lifting off. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Right? This is in reply to Mary saying to him, Your father and I have been actually searching for you. And can you see the lid that Jesus is lifting off? Uh, Joseph's not my father. Right? I'm not going to be restricted by whatever. And I'm not suggesting Joseph was in any way a bad stepfather or whatever. Uh, but Jesus was saying, uh-uh, that's not a lid I'm taking. And in the very next chapter, you'll see the story, the genealogy of Jesus all the way down, and it gets to Joseph, who was thought to be his father. But Jesus has already smashed that lid. Not putting that one on my life. I'm the son of God. And right up to the end, when he's facing his execution and he's asked, who are you? He's God's child. That, nobody was putting that lid back on him. Let me take you back. Some of you will recognize that word. Others may think I've never seen the likes of that in my life. Uh, the catechism was what we used to be instructed in before we could be confirmed by the bishop. And the very first question in the catechism, you had to learn this off by heart, was what is your name? And the answer was Christian name or names. Yeah. But no family name. You're not allowed a family name. Why? Because the lid on our lives must not be our family name. The lid on our lives is that we're children of God. Therefore, Christian name or names was the only answer we were allowed to give. In our baptism service, the minister continues, God has called you into his church to the little child who knows nothing of what's going on around it. And you all reply with, we therefore receive you and welcome you. And it's a faith statement about what we're praying and hoping and longing for for this child. Uh, we receive you and welcome you as a member with us of the body of Christ, as a child of the one heavenly father and an inheritor of the kingdom of God. Think of the lids that are being thrown away there. A member with us of the body of Christ, a child of the one heavenly Father, and an inheritor of the kingdom of God. You see, to jump out of the jar, we need to recognize we've had a change of address. My name is McCartney, my family name. Mac means child of, something like that. Cartney is C on the front of it, something to do with being an artist. Somewhere way back in the borders between Northumbria and Scotland, uh, somebody must have painted a fence or painted a picture or something, uh, and they called him, oh, there's Bobby the artist. Uh, and we've been sons or children of the artist ever since. I have no idea for how long. Um, I'm not aware of a whole lot of art going on in our family. But uh, that's only a name. My address was changed years ago to child of heaven, child of God, member of the body of Christ, child of a he the heavenly father, inheritor of the kingdom of God. And that's us. So it takes me back to Lord Grey of Naunton, governor of Northern Ireland, had no idea, and I mean this next bit with complete humility, had no idea he was speaking with Adrian, child of God, brother of Jesus Christ, the King of heaven and earth.
and you could put your name in instead of mine. That's what God has told us about ourselves, who we are. Let's, don't let anybody screw the lid on. Say you're less than that. You're less valuable than that. You're less able to be what God wants you to be than that. There's a lid on. Throw the lid away. Wow. Don't let the culture, don't let the fear, don't let the bitterness, don't let the past, don't let whatever it is that has been squeezed on top of us uh, cause us to be... Well, we we'll all always have to struggle with this is the truth of it, yeah? But at least begin to understand the lid doesn't have to be on the jar. Lord, would you, by your Holy Spirit, would you set us free to recognize that in the words of our baptism services, uh, we were welcomed by you to be your children. And in the midst of everything around us that says the opposite to us or tries to squash that, we want to grab hold of it again. That we are the daughters, the sons, the brothers and sisters of one another, but part of your family. Could, would you just stay in that sense of God our Father and us his family as we sing these next couple of songs that will help us absorb uh, some of that? Okay, let me take this off.
me, Lord, and use me in whatever way you will. I want my heart to beat in time with yours. I want to walk with you for the rest of my life. I love you with all my heart. And the second one. Father, take my hopes, my dreams. Take me where the eagle flies. Lead me through the desert place. Let me hear the whispers and open the well of living water to quench my thirst. And in this week that has passed, and in fact this summer, awful things have happened to young people. We just pray, God, that you would be with those who have been bereaved or injured because of the death or injury of a young person. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for those in need. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill. Or we may think of anybody known to us now. Lord, be near to those who are afraid or who feel isolated. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light. God of glory, hear our prayer. A prayer for our wider families. God of compassion, whose son Jesus Christ, the child of Mary, shared the life of a home in Nazareth and on the cross drew the whole human family to himself. Strengthen our families in the everyday of daily living, that in joy and in sorrow we may know the power of your presence to bind together and to heal. God of glory, hear our prayer. The working life, whether in employment or our own daily and weekly tasks. God and eternal King, we need you to reign over our emotions and bring peace, especially when we are trying to make life work. We find ourselves getting easily flustered in stressful situations. Sometimes we are flooded with feelings of negativity and hopelessness about life's challenges. May your Holy Spirit give us power over our emotions and enable us to be steady and peaceful in mind and soul. Thank you for being our firm foundation and calming the stormy seas of our minds. God of glory, hear our prayer. And together we say the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Please be seated for our closing prayer. And we use again the collect that we've been using right through September. O God, whose Son has shown the way of the cross to be the way of life, transform and renew our minds that we may not be conformed to this world, but may offer ourselves wholly to you as a living sacrifice. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and be with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And I think, again, there are some people who are out there with some young people or children for the first time. So uh, if you see any of them, uh, pat on the back would be great. We're going to do our tea, coffee, and juice. Uh, I think from now across the winter, we're just we're going to remain in the hall. So out this way and round to the hall, uh, we're able to do that. Uh, if you've got children out there somewhere, don't forget to actually pick them up physically uh, and get them released from whoever's been looking after them. We have a youth gathering tonight at 7 o'clock for year 8 upwards. Uh, so that's at 7 o'clock tonight for about an hour, uh, maybe a wee bit more, but that's on this evening. And we have Alpha on Thursday night at 8 o'clock. And if you weren't able to be there the first week, but you still fancy giving it a go, you'd be more than welcome to join us. Uh, it lasts about an hour and a quarter. So I think that's all.